Good evening to those of you in the UK and welcome to those from around the world. I'm Dr. Brianna Rosen from the University of Oxford, and I want to thank you for joining us for this panel on trends, challenges, and opportunities ahead of the upcoming AI Safety Summit. Less than a week from today, the UK will host the first major global summit on AI safety with the aim of developing international consensus on addressing the risks associated with frontier AI models, which could severely threaten public safety and global security. We are here today to discuss prospects and challenges for achieving that consensus, but also to reflect more broadly on what appears to be a critical inflection point in AI governance, where rapid technological advances are outpacing regulatory frameworks at a time when the world is increasingly fractured and divided. We know that the potential benefits of AI are enormous, but so are the risks from chemical and bioweapons to more effective disinformation campaigns to AI-enabled cyber attacks and lethal autonomous weapon systems. How can we mitigate these risks and ensure the just rewards of AI-enabled technologies? That is the question that policymakers must seek to answer at the upcoming summit and beyond. We have four distinguished speakers with us today to navigate this terrain. Kieran Martin, Professor of Practice in the Management of Public Organizations at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford, whose long and distinguished career in the UK civil service includes, among other endeavors, founding and leading the UK's National Cyber Security Center. Julia Owano, affiliate of Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and an inaugural member of the Meta Oversight Board. Roxana Radu, Associate Professor of Digital Technologies and Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government and Chair of the Global Internet Governance Academic Network. And Robert Traeger, Senior Research Fellow at the Blavatnik School, Co-Director of the Oxford Martin AI Governance Initiative and International Governance Lead at the Center for the Governance of AI. Welcome to all of our panelists. I wanna kick us off with just a few framing questions and then I'll turn it over to the panelists to say about five to 10 minutes um, in response and then we will open it up to the audience for questions. So the Prime Minister just gave a speech today outlining the global responsibility that we all have to address the risks of AI, in which he said the future of AI is safe AI. So one of the questions that we might discuss today is what will it take to actually achieve safe AI? How does the UK's approach to AI and the AI risks that it poses compare to other countries? What role should industry, civil society and academia play in shaping AI regulation? In terms of the upcoming AI Safety Summit in the UK, what should it aim to achieve and what will constitute success? What are the measures that we need to see taken following the summit to build on progress? And finally, how can a global consensus on AI be forged given divergent regulatory approaches that have emerged around the world and deepening geopolitical competition? These are a couple of guiding questions to frame our discussion. Now I'd like to turn it over to Kieran Martin to give us his views. Kieran, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Brianna. Thank you for setting this up. And thanks to everybody who's given up their time to join us. Um, so I'm going to start with a deeply unfashionable remark, which is I'm going to say that Rishi Sunak's speech was really rather good. And the initiative that he's spearheading is broadly worthwhile. And if you're based in this country, it's not fashion, particularly fashionable at the moment to say anything nice about the prime minister or the government. But I think this is a worthwhile initiative. There aren't very many votes in it a year out from an election, but it is a crucial and vital long term set of issues for society here in the UK and for everywhere else. So um, it's very easy, and no doubt in the course of this discussion, my colleagues will raise legitimate and potentially quite fundamental problems with um, the way that it's being configured, and no doubt plenty of people in the audience and the press and so forth will um, uh, will pick holes in some of the things that are uh, are happening. Um, but, you know, uh, that's because all expert communities um, uh, are succumb to the temptation to let the perfect be the enemy of the of the good. And the tech community in particular loves to let the perfect be the uh, be, be, be the enemy of the good. So in big picture terms, I think there are three really quite basic questions uh, from the point of view of the prime minister and the government and, and the UK. Um, and three sort of simple tests. That, and, they, and so far, uh, the PM, I think, passes all of them. So the first test is, is it better that something like this is happening than it is not happening? And I think the answer there is, is yes. I was 
looking through one of my favorite quotes from sort of tech history, which is Dr. Vinton Cerf, the, one of the godfathers of the internet, you know, author of the famous co-author of the famous protocol, um, talking in 2019 about essentially saying, look, we were not aware we were laying the tracks for a digital superhighway, and we didn't think about the people who had misused the technology. And we live with that every day. It was an accident. It wasn't anybody's fault. But we didn't have any guardrails. We didn't have these types of discussions. And it is better for all its imperfections that we start as we can now foresee in a way that was not foreseeable 30, 40 years ago with the internet, as we can foresee the way this tech is evolving. It is right that we start this type of conversation now. Secondly, and this is a narrow parochial UK point, but I did spend my career, as you said, in the UK uh, government. Um, is it better, given that something is happening, is it better for the UK to be leading it than following somebody else's lead? And I think from a British point of view, the answer to that is a fairly obvious and unambiguous yes. There are very few, if any, observable downsides to the UK leading this from its own uh, um, uh, point of view and plenty of potential upsides given the scale of, uh, of, of the ambition. The third test then is, you know, is it likely to do some good or at least do no harm? Is it likely to sort of meet the Hippocratic oath of public uh, policy? And I think here, tone is really important. And I think, you know, the PM speech is worth reading and rereading because it's a really tricky balance to get right. I think he just about does it. And that's quite useful for a politician. He doesn't, he acknowledges the catastrophic risk, but literally says in these words, people should not lose sleep over it, at least not yet. And I think that's a very, very powerful thing for a national leader to say amidst lots of, frankly, the realization of you know, decades of sci-fi is now being played out in the in the national newspapers and um, on online every, every day. So I think he's right to sort of reject, but not, um, uh, not fully eliminate the catastrophic risk. And I think that's a really difficult thing to get right, broadly got it right. Then he looks at a bunch of risks. Now you can quibble and actually I don't really go for the uh, phrase about frontier AI and the little segmentation that they go for. So those who know I'm talking about, um, but in a sense, they're going for the uh, major, but not catastrophic risks that are likely to happen. So as he says, disinformation is already upon us. What do we do about that? The risk of proliferation of really bad sort of capabilities and so forth. You know, I think broadly speaking, they've struck the right uh, the, 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 the 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 right tone and are focusing broadly on just on the right issues. Um, and you can quibble about those, but frankly, you get into massive as an ex bureaucrat, you get it fixing legitimate concerns, the sort of legitimate concerns that are being heard uh, in the global debate. Fixing those would have taken so long that you would have postponed this enterprise by a year, two years, three years, maybe longer uh, to get all of them right. And there you are letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, then look at some of the big calls um, that have been made. So, one is, um, was this going to be? Um, a genuinely global conversation, or was it going to be a cozy club of like-minded Westerners? And I think the decision on China is very controversial. His immediate predecessor has already denounced it, but I think it's quite brave and it's probably right. Um, I don't think you're being nice um, for those of us who have been critical of the Chinese misuse of technology for internal repression, as I have been. Uh, I don't think you're being nice uh, to the Chinese um, to say that, look, if a club of like-minded Western nations get together um, and seek to frame a set of rules for the rest of the world, it won't work. It won't work for two reasons. One is it won't include one of the two big AI powers in China, uh, which will go and develop its own advanced AI anyway, and all the risks will still be there. We just won't have the global discussion as we have in other areas like nuclear safety with, um, with, with China. And secondly, I don't think the rest of the world will buy it. You know, um, we do know that um, the rest of the world is demanding a greater say. And if it's the same old Western power saying we're going to, and um, you know, governments and companies saying we're going to get together and set uh, whole rules, I think I think the rest of the world will uh, will reject that. So 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 it won't work. I think it is a really difficult but ultimately correct uh, decision. I think then. And no doubt my colleagues will raise some of these issues. There are genuine challenges about inclusivity. You know, how do you govern this thing? What is the correct demarcation of the role of governments in the private sector? Really interesting aside um, from the Sunak speech about the nation state is the area where this can be done. Obviously, the European Union would, would not necessarily uh, uh, agree. Maybe other uh, countries would uh, not agree. And of course, the PM is, of course, spearheading a multinational and public private effort to get something going. So it'd be interesting to sort of unpack um, over time what the UK government means by that. But over the 
period beyond the summit, because let's face it, you know, the, in terms of your question about what would success look like, I think getting a show on the road that does not currently exist is what success looks like. Over time, then, I think there needs to be greater involvement for other parts of the, for, for the full globe, for civic society, and 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 so on. Um, but you've got to start somewhere, and this is a decent enough uh, place to start. So I would essentially conclude where I started. Um, this is, you know, there will be elements of this will be clunky, highly imperfect, open to all sorts of legitimate uh, criticism. But the alternative is not perfection. The alternative is nothing or something much more fragmented, something that doesn't have that global reach, something that doesn't have a reasonably balanced assessment of it that's either too complacent on the one side or too catastrophic. So ultimately, a series of really, really difficult balancing acts have been executed so far well enough. And I think the other thing to say is let's reserve judgment to see what comes out at the other end. We, it, hasn't actually, uh, it hasn't actually happened yet, but I think it's a worthwhile act of, of global leadership by the UK. Thank you so much, Kieran. That's really illuminating. As you said, the, the summit has been criticized for the focus being too narrow and also for the participation not being global enough. So this is something that I'm sure we'll get into in greater depth as, as the discussion goes on. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Julio Wano for a somewhat different perspective, for a US perspective, both on the summit and the broader issue of how we can establish um, global consensus on AI governance. Julio, over to you. Thank you very much, Brianna, and uh, good morning, at least for me, for me, uh, joining you all the way from the West Coast uh, in the United States. Uh, it is absolutely, uh, first of all, a delight to, to be present here, but it, it is also a, an important moment. So I have to express my, my deep honor for the opportunity to share those remarks. Um, Important moment because indeed uh, the, the prime minister of one of the most powerful countries in the world has just announced the first uh, ever AI institute uh, that will be created to um, anticipate, at least attempt to anticipate on the risk of presented by uh, such a, a, a unique innovation such as artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, of course, like uh, my, 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 colleague, previous panelists, I absolutely am delighted that a government and not the least government, uh, one of the, you know, the oldest democracies in the world uh, is taking the lead on showing the way. What, is, what, is, what does it mean today for a government to have its toes, tiptoe into the AI space without, of course, uh, superseding ourselves as governments to uh, start proceeding ourselves to the, the tech companies. Um, that is an extremely complicated challenge, uh, but uh, uh, we absolutely uh, look forward to uh, the example that, that the UK will undoubtedly set in this space. With that being said, um, I wanted to uh, address some of the, the questions that you asked uh, Brianna, and, and the first of which was what should we expect? Right. What should we expect from the summit and what constitutes success? I think my answer, which applies to the summit, but also, of course, to the institute um, initiated, created by the UK government today and to any other government that anticipates to. Sorry, somebody sent me a beautiful picture of my, my son and I, I, uh, it becomes, it, um, I lost my focus. I apologize. Um, the remark that I will share will apply not only to this summit, but obviously to any government that wishes to uh, make AI safer. The first uh, and foremost important thing to do is to reassure us. Uh, I, I hope this summit and any other initiative will step a little bit away from the, I almost want to say um, provocatively, the fear mongering around AI. Yes. There are risks. Yes, uh, they are um, potentially transformative uh, challenges posed by that by that unique, unprecedented innovation. It is true, but at the same time, it is exactly like the internet. It is an important and unique accelerator of creativity, of collaboration among humans uh, beyond borders and in an even faster pace than what we have seen so far with the internet. 
uh, that would be an important remark for me to make. And, and it would be unfair for me to just, you know, to leave this space with only focusing on the risk. The risks are necessary, important um, as a leading actor in the digital rights space. I, 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 I'm the leader of Internet Sans Frontières, Internet Without Borders, which is a nonprofit that has for the past almost 15 years fought extremely hard to make sure our human rights online are protected as they are supposedly, or at least we try to protect them on, uh, on the non-virtual space. So we try to make sure those are protected online as well. Um, while focusing on the risk, we should also not shy away from talking about the opportunities, especially opportunities for civil society actors, such as myself uh, and others, opportunities for governments, uh, not to surveil more, absolutely not. I hope we will, you know, a little bit step away from that, uh, from, from that very conservative and repressive vision around AI, but instead, and leaves AI to make sure citizens can contribute more to the, the, the management of the public good. Um, or for companies making sure to propose tools that will help internet users around the world be more creative, um, make a living with the internet and a better living. I think I really see the internet and AI as an opportunity for a million, potentially billions of youth around the world who today lack those same opportunities. So uh, yes, it is important to focus on the risk. And it is also important to talk about the opportunities because when you talk about the opportunities, um, and that, that comes to one other question that you, that you asked us, Brianna, which was what role should industry, civil society, and government play in shaping AI regulation or in making sure that AI remains safe for all? Well, uh, that the, Thinking about opportunities also makes us realize that really civil society organizations, citizens, really users have a seat at the table, must have a seat at the table, uh, at the table of discussions around AI regulation and AI safety. Um, why is it so? Because I think users, even before government, users are the ones who see the challenges and the problems. Of course, the creators, some AI tool creators will see those problems, but they will not see the extent of the problem unless they listen, unless there is a feedback loop that allows users and um, civil society actors more generally to uh, be, be a, well, to be able to alert us on things that are potentially not going well. And also open our eyes to things that are working or that could work. Uh, even better. Um, and when I say that civil society must have a seat at the table, I really look forward to that institute initiated by the UK authorities. I look forward to hearing from that institute that it will welcome, that will re it will reserve a seat for civil society representatives. I look forward to hearing from that institute that it will have feedback loops to allow users uh, and citizens more broadly of the of the UK. But I, I and hopefully also beyond the UK, the Commonwealth Society, for instance, the Commonwealth space um, could have an opportunity to uh, shape the agenda of that AI Safety Institute or any other safety institute initiated by other governments. I think making sure that civil society actors and users have a seat at the table, not just to for the beautiful picture, but a genuine engagement with that with those civil society actors with actionable um, items to be worked on together in collaboration with with tech companies, but also with government. Um, that for me would be uh, an extremely important aspect to keep in mind as we're talking about AI safety and AI regulation. And when it comes to the the, the role of tech companies, um, it is extremely important for those tech companies to remain open to oversight, scrutiny, uh, and criticism. Not criticism that we think is okay, right? It, it, is, it, it has become mainstream for tech companies to call for regulation and to say, we must be controlled, we must be regulated. Yes, that is true, we all agree on that. Uh, but the devil is in the detail. And the detail is, yes, the extent of accountability that you're ready to uh, to to show to the public and, of course, to uh, government authorities around the world. 
and specifically in the UK as we're talking about the UK now. Um, I think that is, that is an important other aspect when it comes to uh, this collaboration that needs to happen, that will need to happen between different stakeholders. And last but not least, uh, going back to governments again, uh, I would strongly or urge governments, again, not to uh, sit behind closed doors with only tech companies in the room because you will not get the full picture. That is, I mean, when I say you, I mean government representatives and government in general. Uh, the, you will miss half of the picture at the very least uh, if uh, you only had, um, you know, dialogue behind closed doors with tech companies. History has proved that. Uh, I think we can inspire ourselves from the relatively long history now of social media and of the internet development in general. Um, my, 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 the previous speaker was uh, referring to uh, Vinsurf. I think, uh, it, it, yes, it is important to, to make sure we can tap into the whole history of the internet uh, and, and make sure we, uh, we you know, create a path for AI that profits to anyone that's beneficial for society and that profits government, uh, private sector entities, but also users, users and civil society actors in general. Uh, when, one of your other questions uh, related, Brianna, related to um, a global consensus consensus to be forged uh, on AI given the di divergent regulatory approaches. Yes, there are um, disagreements to some extent, uh, even when it comes to talking about re AI regulation. Uh, but the disagreements, in my opinion, stem from the fact that many governments want to replace the companies. That is absolutely impossible. No government and no civil society actors, really, honestly, can genuinely think they can replace and understand AI and the risks better than the companies. Oh, uh, I think it is, it is also important to be aware of our limitations and to be humble as government entities. By humble, I mean, let us make the effort of understanding what AI is about. Let us make the effort of understanding what, how machine learning models are being built. Let, uh, let us make the effort of understanding uh, what civil society actors mean actually when they talk about bias and about inclusion uh, when it comes to large language models. Let us be humble about the fact that we don't know all the languages spoken online. We are not sure that our machine learning mo language models um, uh, uh, grasp the diversity uh, the complexity sometimes of languages, different languages spoken around the world. And we can make sure that the data that sees those um, language models, we have to make sure with the whole community required, we have to make sure that those language models can understand as many languages as possible that exist in the world, but also specifically online. If we don't make that humble effort, we will uh, very rapidly uh, face the same difficulties and hurdles that we faced when it came to social media or internet in general. And that is when we overlook languages, cultural spaces, geographical spaces, because, well, those languages are spoken by almost nobody, or, oh, it happens in, I don't know, in Africa or in the Caribbean or in you know Latin America, it's very far. Um, we, we don't have the same means to cover and to make sure we understand everything that happens from those parts of the world. Well, I think that is a mistake. And um, inclusivity will require from us to make the humble effort to reach out to those who speak the languages, to those who understand the cultural uh, specificity that we will need to factor into any language model, any model really, uh, that will uh, be used for machine learning purposes. Um, making sure that we understand all those languages and cultures will be extremely important because if we leave any language or any culture behind, we take the risk of creating in the whole AI ecosystem vulnerabilities that can be um, harnessed by the worst actors uh, that exist currently online. We have seen that with social media. We have seen that with other iterate, well, web 2.0, other iterations of the web, uh, we should be extremely careful, even more careful when it comes to artificial intelligence. So um, yes, 
probably my last remark for now would be to build a global consensus. Let's acknowledge our uh, our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, uh, and again, let's rely on frameworks that we know. We know the international. Uh, 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 declaration of, of human rights. We know all this body of standards, rules, norms um, that have been created internationally and to which virtually all countries of, on earth have adhered to and have agreed to respect the foundation, the found fundamental rights and liberties that are, um, you know, that have been proclaimed in those various legal instruments. I think it is important in order to build a consensus to remember, to remind ourselves of, of those international uh, frameworks, uh, because that's the only space where with difficulty, it is true, and recent events show that. Uh, but despite the difficulties, international human rights spaces are virtually the only spaces where we can look for that consensus to happen. So yes, my urge for more humility, including from government, and also, uh, uh, my urge to remember that we have the instruments, we have the framework, the international law framework, the international human rights framework that can absolutely be leveraged for AI and all the safety frameworks that we want to create. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie. You raised a number of really valuable points that I'm sure we're going to get into greater detail in the discussion. Uh, in the interest of time, I want to move now to Roxana, but I do want to remind our viewers that you can put your questions in the chat throughout the discussion, and then we'll get to them during the Q&A. Roxana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brianna. And I'd like to start with the focus of the summit. It's AI safety, and it has been further refined over time. There wasn't a clear understanding of what that meant when the summit was first announced. But we know now that it uh, will tackle two types of risks. One is the misuse of frontier AI models, particularly by non-state actors, in order to perform harms like cyber attacks or design uh, bioweapons in order to enhance and accelerate the capabilities we currently have. And the second type of risk that will be tackled in the discussion is the potential loss of control or the dangers that these systems start acting autonomously in ways that don't necessarily align with our intentions or our values. So the summit is looking into how we can better track these models and what uh, uses um, they have out there in the, in the world. And I think the success of the summit lies actually in how this focus has been specified and in the fact that it's relatively narrow so that it can bring to the table um, enough uh, perspectives around issues that are important to all of us. So having identified this relatively narrow set of issues, I think, is a uh, very good step in the right direction. And the second uh, element for success will be the depth of the preparatory activities. We've heard quite a bit about that so far, but we will see um, how it plays out in practice. Having about 100 delegates to, to the meeting means um, conversations will actually be possible. It will not really be um, um, a form of unilateral imposition of, um, um, of ideas. It will really be a dialogue, and that's very important. Um, but I think we need to, to think of it as a conversation starter more than anything else. We have the 1st and the 2nd of November as this uh, first attempt to, to build a process with public leadership in the driving seat. And uh, that's important because so far this space has been primarily privately dominated. We have a number of attempts that came out this week that all point to states taking a more active role. But we see a little bit of divergence there. So we've had uh, an announcement uh, from the, the Chinese president earlier this week about a global AI governance initiative uh, dedicated to countries already participating in the Belt and Road Initiative. And that particular uh, set of measures will include also assessments and testing for AI risk levels and also um, 
uh, talk about how regulations around data and privacy could be reformed to match uh, a reality in which AI is omnipresent. So that is one set of, um, of concerns that the Chinese are raising. Then there is a White House executive order that has just been announced uh, targeting the public use of AI, so how federal agencies engage in the deployment of AI. And here it's uh, more about the risk assessments and evaluations in the public sector, but also the establishment of technological standards uh, as a process to be led by the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. In the EU, as we know, there has been an AI Act on the table for, for a while now with a very expansive remit that goes beyond uh, the use of uh, AI in the public sector. It also covers uh, private sectors and it goes from um, insurance all the way to uh, biometric identification. So very, very broad mandate for, for the EU there. The UN has started a number of conversations around this as well. Um, the Office of uh, the Tech Envoy is uh, currently completing the selection of experts for this uh, high-level group uh, on AI. And we expect all major organizations to have at least one initiative on AI by the end of this year. We've seen many others, there's no time to list all of them, but there is momentum right now at the international level to come up with um, a shared understanding of the risks. And this is what the UK summit is doing as well. And in a way, it's the first to be doing that um, with respect to how we, we understand these risks. And we are seeing um, a, an important um, alignment of interests here that I think is, um, is um, relevant for how we're going to shape the AI governance going forward. Coming out of this summit, we will have at least a group of countries that um, adhere to one definition of risks and build they are working towards building a process uh, of establishing these guardrails. And we're also seeing more of a push for international uh, cooperation. Now, the question of inclusivity is also important. The fact that we won't necessarily have as much representation as we would want to see in these global discussions of uh, academia, of uh, um, non-state actors, and in particular civil society and ultimately some of the end users as well of these technologies. Uh, it's, it's a really important consideration, but if we look at it as, a, as, as just the start of the conversation, we, we can all contribute to bringing in those other perspectives down the line as long as there is, um, there is openness to have this, uh, um, this inclusive discussion. So I really uh, look at it as a first step in the right direction. As Kiran was saying, it's better than not having anything. So having, having these discussions uh, next week is really important. Uh, but then the question of how we bring everybody in stays, uh, stays as relevant. And safety is a relatively narrow way of looking at AI governance, but we have to start somewhere. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roxana, for those illuminating remarks. We've, we've spoken a bit about the importance of civil society in these debates. And I think the flip side of that is also, of course, the problem of regulatory capture, which is a particularly acute problem here. So that's something that we might also discuss later today. I want to turn now to Robert to give us uh, his views on prospects for international cooperation on AI governance and what will constitute success in the summit. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brianna, and thank you to everybody. Um, the uh, These really beautiful remarks from the other panelists have, I think, made my job uh, much easier. Um, and so I'll just, I'll start out by saying two things, and then I'll get to this question of what uh, should we expect to come out of the summit. So uh, the first thing, just to pick up on something that Roxana was mentioning, is the extraordinary energy that currently exists in international spaces to deal with this issue. And that includes the Secretary General's office and the Secretary General, Secretary General himself, who is attending uh, extraordinary numbers of, uh, of, of meetings on AI, apparently, um, and an incredible number of fora uh, where these issues are being discussed, as Roxana was saying. 
Uh, and what has, I think, been particularly inspiring uh, is to see all of the energy at these uh, of national representatives, for instance, the um, permanent representatives to the United Nations who are really engaging in these issues. So the the amount of energy around the world, uh, I think, is is extraordinary to see now. And I and I think we we hopefully will be able to channel it and use it and, and make some productive things uh, come out of it. Second thing I wanted to mention is just um, the, you know, I, I'll say some things that I think we can look out for uh, sort of uh, as we have popcorn in a, in a sense and we're watching the summit and, and we want to see what's going to happen. Um, and they're not really criticisms, but they're, you know, things that, you know, I think uh, civil society actors in, in particular uh, have to have to watch uh, to, to make sure that that things are, are going on a path that uh, they can have confidence in. But I do also think that the UK deserves some real credit, uh, particularly in constructing what was the Frontier AI Task Force and will become uh, the Safety Institute. And um, that's really a world leading capability. And it's it's not just a, a set of technical competencies, although it is that. What the government has done in almost a whole of government fashion is really upskill on these issues since the start of the summer. And that has been an extraordinary task. And it frankly has been extraordinary to watch, but but they have done it and they've therefore placed themselves, I think, in a in a sort of world leading uh position. Um because really there aren't uh, other countries that that have done something similar. Um, okay, so turning now to this question of what will come out of the summit, of course, the, the Safety Institute will come out of the summit and that uh, hopefully will be an extraordinary thing. One thing to mention about the Safety Institute, there are actually um, four areas that it's, um, it's, uh, it's supposed to focus on. And it's a little bit broader than the focus of the summit itself. As Roxana was saying, there are these two areas of risk that, they, that the summit uh, focuses on. But the Safety Institute uh, has those areas. And it also has a, a societal impacts uh, mission, which uh, I was very glad to see and and I I know was um fought for uh, by some folks and um and so uh I think there's a hope that that the that that it can consider a broader set of impacts than the somewhat narrower set that that the uh summit will focus on um second thing that will come out is some version this is at a guess um but some version of what uh, were called the White House commitments from the companies. And um, I hope they won't call them the White House commitments, but I'm a little worried that they that they will, um, because I think it will be harder for the rest of the world or some actors in the world to go along with it if they're called the White House commitments. Um, but um, they will hopefully be a, a somewhat more specific and in the details uh, version of, of that. And so one thing that we can look out for is whether there are any real new and substantive commitments from the firms. I think um, the, the, there have been a lot of questions that have been asked of the firms, uh, very incisive questions. There have been a dialogue that's been happening, but what actually is going to come out of that? Are the firms going to give what look to the rest of us uh, like sensible answers to those questions, I think that's something that uh, we can watch and and trying to find out. Third thing that uh, I think will come out of the summit is some sort of uh, consensus risk uh, statement from a wide set of actors. Uh, that'll be interesting to see if there's pushback or if uh, many actors around the world are are willing to uh, to go along with that. Uh, but that certainly is something that is is being uh, sought after. And then the fourth thing that I think is important that uh, will come out of the summit, hopefully, is another summit. Uh, <laughs> that may sound cynical, um, but but no, actually, I think that uh, this is now conceived of as the first in a process. And uh, and now the hope is that there will be another summit in six to seven months. And um, and so that so this summit is is in a way a, a beginning of a bunch of actors getting on the same page, but I think the hope has to be that this summit is used as a venue to really task some set of actors 
with preparing for the next summit, because that also gets me to some things that will not, uh, I think, come out of the summit. And that includes um, really, it includes, um, I don't think there will be very much work on a standards and monitoring regime. Um, I was a little bit, um, well, I was hoping that there would be more of a push in that direction. Uh, but I think for a variety of reasons, including work that is happening in other fora, in particular the Hiroshima process uh, led by Japan through the G7, um, that are doing some of that work, the, the UK has decided, I think, uh, not to really push too much in that direction. And, um, you know, you can say, oh, well, it's being done elsewhere, but it, it wasn't done it's not being done in the same way elsewhere with such a broad set of actors as it could be in this context. And so um, that's something that I think we won't see coming out of this summit. But on the other hand, what we may see is a little move in that direction when, um, when we're thinking about how to task actors for the next summit. And that I think is quite quite interesting because you know what is this next summit going to be? Will there be uh, will there be some international actors who will be uh, trying to take some of the commitments that we already have, some of the ideas that we already have, and really uh, create more consensus and figure some things out that that we need to figure out? Which brings me to something else that I think probably will not come out of this summit but we have to get to eventually. So um, I'm hoping that we can have a tasking in this summit to, to get towards it. And that is some level of consensus on what sorts of areas of regulation actually should be internationalized. Because right now we, you know, we don't have that. Um, and I think you know, there's really a, a diverse set of views. And of course there are national regulations that are in some cases conflicting. And so figuring out what really should be the subject of national standards and what should be left to uh, individual jurisdictions uh, to regulate themselves is something that, that we really need to do. And that requires, requires an actor to do it. That is to say, it requires, you know, requires a document, it requires a, a consensus document, it requires um, you know, the, the U.S. government, for instance, right now uh, has a, a set of uh, principles uh, that it will publish in, in, I believe, a week or two uh, related to how it sees defense, uh, AI and defense. And, um, and it, it published those uh, months ago, but now it has engaged in a process talking to many, many countries uh, about how they see it and making changes to what it had earlier published uh, in order to have a, a broader consensus and reflect, reflect the views of a broader set of countries. And that requires a lot of conversations. And that's exactly the sort of thing that, that we really need to see in this area of AI safety. But we, it's not clear uh, that we will, I think, see that uh, as yet. Um, right. Um, yeah, so maybe just I'll just end on that and say there, those are the two questions that I think uh, is worth looking at as the summit happens. One is what exactly are the commitments from private sector actors? And the other is what is the preparation like for the next summit in six to seven months? Who is hosting that summit? Does it include, is it is it uh, clear that it's including a broad set of actors? Um, is, it, is it a process that will actually give voice to um, to many communities, to so all the affected communities around the world, uh, because some of the other fora where these technologies are being regulated don't seem to be doing those things. So this is one of the one of the places where that could happen, but will it happen? Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for those extremely uh, helpful framing remarks. I, I'd like to open up the discussion now to the audience. So feel free to, again, as I said, add questions to the Q&A box, type the questions, we'll read them out loud and engage in some discussion. Um, as people are thinking through the questions, because I think we've given them quite a bit to reflect on in a short time, uh, I wonder if I might draw on something that uh, Kieran and, and Robert and others have all touched on today, which is, is do no harm enough, given that we appear to be on the cusp of potentially men's harm from resulting from AI? And 
what should the summit after the summit look like? So Robert hinted at it a bit, the standards and monitoring regime, consensus on what areas of regulation should be internationalized, the level at which um, AI governance should occur. And I think it has to happen at every level. Um, what else should we should we see? And I'd, I'd like to bring Kieran into this conversation and then give other panelists a chance to respond as well, because I think it's a really, really great point. Thanks, um, Brianna, and thanks to other panelists for brilliant contributions. Um, I think the um, I think the main um, challenge is going to be working out which bits to focus on and at, at multilateral levels. So Robert's spoken to that a little bit, but just to unpack it a bit, um, I think um, it goes back to the rather intriguing point that the British Prime Minister made, uh, saying that the nation state was the right place to regulate it, which I think may not stand up to um, reality, may not survive contact with reality in all of these uh, circumstances. So I think there's a genuine discussion to be had about two things. One is that what are you going to uh, what are you going to uh, say about the existential sort of risk? How seriously are you going to uh, talk it up or down? I think Rishi Sinat very correctly talked it uh, down today, but how prominent is that going to be? That's one thing. Then the second thing is, um, you know, which of the many areas, if you look at, of course, because as well as the speech today, the UK government published a pretty lengthy analysis of, of AI risks, which again, people will quibble with, but probably better than exists or not, which of those things, A, are most important and B, lend themselves to multilateral um, uh, discussions. So um, I think as well as, you know, one of the risks about um, in, in this type of process, and Roxana, who's a veteran of various UN processes on cyber, may disagree with this analysis or may actually um, allow herself a, a sort of wry smile um, at them. One of, one of, one of the um, risks is that the process um, preoccupies itself with, with further process. And I think it has to. I think, you know, what does the next summit look like is a really important issue. Um, all the things Robert said, who chairs it and so forth. But I think there are, um, you know, th there are actually areas that we don't have any consensus on yet, which is which of this massive, you know, misnamed thing called artificial intelligence do we actually care about the most in terms of uh, realistically going to do people harm in the forthcoming age? Because even your question, Brianna, you know, the do no harm uh, principle. Um, when we may be in the cusp of, um, uh, of 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 imminent significant harm, there's no consensus that we're on the cusp of imminent uh, uh, um, uh, harm. You know, is there any prospect? You know, I think there has to be very very strong technical technological expert um, input uh, input into this. And then there's bits in the middle which I think are really really interesting. So one of the things that I um, have have long thought about as we've had a sort of um, resurgence of tech catastrophization in the last year or so since ChatGPT came on. It's very, very reminiscent of um, what we were saying about cyber 20 years ago. We were going to, you know, we were going to have cyber 9-11, cyber Pearl Harbors. These were all real warnings by serious people. The Economist had its tumbling Man Manhattan style skyline um, via a cyber attack and so forth. And it wasn't really the way uh, cyber worked. And I often think as well as getting that sort of realism and realistic analysis, there is a thing around the governance of the, of the technology and the tech and the tech research. So when all the catastrophization rhetoric came up uh, this year, one challenge to it was, are you seriously saying um, that you have been, you know, you, you know, some of the sort of pioneers, you know, you've been working on potentially species threatening technology that you think is on the brink of unleashing, whether it's, you know, the ability to create large scale you know, physical viruses that will kill millions of people. You know, you're saying you've made all that, um, uh, you've been doing all of that and all of a sudden uh, you're, um, you know, sort of asking to be regulated in, in Julie's um, uh, phrase. And I think she, she made a really good point about that the point being that look um one of the ways in which you know sort of reason and measured sort of judgment and articulation of the threats one of the reasons that really matters is that it is completely implausible that a bunch of people have spent the last x years developing completely lethal technology uh in without anybody noticing and in violation of no existing law that's just not plausible. So as we, you know, one question, which I think is really important for the global governance um, uh, of AI is as we get into areas where you know, perhaps research breakthroughs will get a little bit more dangerous, what are the disclosure obligations from the scientists and the tech and the technologists developing them? To whom? 
Uh, what do they do with them? Is there an obligation to share internationally? What happens is, as is often the case, particularly as you know, the US is still the leading power by a country mile in many forms of technology, certainly in the West, but a lot of the researchers are in cross-border uh, teams and uh, cross-jurisdiction teams. How, what, how are we going to make all of that? So if there's a sort of breakthrough that needs managing, to whom is it disclosed, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of issues. Um, you know, First of all, I, so... That's a very long-winded way of saying I think there are two things that risk being crowded out by a focus on, you know, who's in charge, who's the next lead, what's the role of the private sector, what's the civic society. Important though all those questions are. One is where is the scientific and technological input and the and the, the real world analysis, the economists, the social scientists, all the stuff that we learned from COVID about the need for an absolutely multidisciplinary uh, analysis of the sort of risks that we face. Where, where does all that fit in? And how do you try and get some form of consensus around that? And then secondly, you know, what's the actual governance of the tech as well as the commercials? Um, I think we could lose sight of that. So just some thoughts. Thank you so much, uh, Kieran. That's that's really illuminating, and I agree with you that uh, even if we are not on the cusp of existential uh, harm from AI, we are certainly on the cusp of imminent risk from humans leveraging AI in various ways to establish new patterns of domination and violence over each other. So I think those are real risks that we have to contend with as well. Uh, I want to give Roxana a, a chance to respond because uh, I think you invoked her, Kieran. And before turning to Roxana, I also just want to pose one of the questions from, from our audience so that panelists can be thinking about it. Uh, so two, two members of our audience asked questions along similar lines, which is essentially by focusing on regulatory frameworks, uh, you know, and, and are we essentially tying our hands where good actors will follow the rules and, and other actors will not? Uh, and then a related question, do we have the existing rules and laws and regulations and tools that we need to regulate AI, or do we have to come up with new rules essentially? And so I want to turn first to Roxana to comment uh, briefly in response to what Kieran said, and then uh, I'll turn to Julie because I think she mentioned uh, some some uh, asked, she had some aspects in her remark about existing rules and regulations. So Roxana, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. I do agree that we risk uh, talking too much about process at a disadvantage of uh, some of the substantial issues that should be on the agenda. And I even take issue with the framing of do no harm, right? It's It's been around for a while in the use, in the language of tech companies, and it comes with a particular perspective that as long as we are doing everything all right, and we have no particular knowledge of uh, some forms of harm that uh, are induced by our technology, then we are fine. And I take issue with that because I think we want to move to a space of AI governance where we are doing more than just preventing potential harm, where we are actually actively intervening in the public interest. And that's not necessarily the case. So what we are moving towards is probably a better understanding of the liability regime. And that's going to be part of the conversation with uh, the big tech, I guess, at the summit. But it's not just enough to say, well, we have some liability regime in place and some countries will apply it better than others because they have a better rule of law and they have better ways of monitoring this. I think we need to move towards uh, an international perspective on this and take whatever agreement we have around the international law applicability into the regulatory side of things and have a better understanding of how this works cross-border. So I don't necessarily agree that we need to stop ourselves at uh, do no harm. I think we need to very actively think about the role of public interventions in order to have a better AI future. I agree. It seems to me that uh, in too many cases, the principle of do no harm actually can lead to quite catastrophic harm, uh, particularly those forms of harm that may be less visible and, and, and less seen. Uh, I, I want to turn to Julie to bring her into this conversation to address the question that we had about regulation and uh, whether you know other actors will follow these types of rules, how we can ensure compliance. Uh, and then uh, I will raise another question about uh, regulation and whether there's an emerging consensus and how that consensus can be forged. So, Julie, let's turn to you now. Thank you very much, Brianna. I wanted to very briefly um, 
touch on the question around, you know, is it, what the, what's the way forward? Is it state regulation or is it international um, global consensus or regulation on, on AI? Um, I, I, I would like to probably intervene at two levels. The first one is that a, a nation-focused approach is unfortunately a limited, to say the least, approach. Uh, when we think about AI, we should think about it just as the internet and the web is, which is a an infrastructure where the no, the very notion of borders doesn't make really physical sense. Um, I, my, my organization is called Internet Without Borders. Uh, it, it's a, it's actually a repetition because. It is very difficult. Some governments have tried. We think, of course, about China, and we think about, and it's and it's a, uh, you know, it's um, uh, Chinese wall. Uh, we also think about the in sovereign internet efforts initiated by countries like Russia, uh, but we feel that we still see that those approaches uh, that try to, um, you know, to to match the physical borders in the real world with the physical borders in the virtual world uh, does not work. Uh, it's not realistic. Same goes for, for AI. And I'm mentioning this because a state-focused, a nation-focused approach, oh, yeah, uh, a nation-focused approach will, um, will, will not allow us to see, as I was talking in my initial remarks, talking about in my initial remarks, will not allow us to see uh, Places of the world where vulnerabil vulnerabilities are being exploited to target more stable democracies or more powerful countries. I think the example of the war in Ukraine is extremely telling. While we were all cheering in the United States and in the European Union, we were all cheering that we were done with disinformation, Russian disinformation around the conflict uh, because we had banned Russia Today, we had banned Sputnik and many other initiatives that we started at the, the time of the, the war, when the war started in 2022. Well, while we were cheering, at the very same time, the Russians were doubling, tripling efforts around this information in Africa, in Asia, and in Southern America and Latin America. The result of that is when you get to a vote, to vote against Russia, um, at the General Assembly, for instance, or at the Human Rights Council, you see clearly where that disinformation has been extremely effective. So I, I would I, I would say that a, a you know there, there is no way we will have at some point to sit at the table and agree internationally on what we think is uh, is important for a safe AI. Um, now, with regard to what can be done when the do no harm uh, framework will fail because I agree with you. It, 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 there, there are examples in history that show it does not necessarily work. Um, and um, I, I, I can only advocate. I think it's important to advocate for the issue of for the word oversight and governance. It is extremely important that AI does not does not continue to flourish without any um, actual actionable impactful oversight mechanism. Uh, what that looks like, I don't know. I can only propose. I'm part of one example of what oversight of tech could look like, but that's certainly not the, the only example. So obviously, oversight and governance must be part of the conversation. And when I say oversight, I mean external oversight, not companies overseeing themselves, because we also know that does not always bring the results we want. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julie. So I want to turn to a question from the audience about interoperability across different AI governance approaches and regimes, because I think it's a really important question, because we know that the EU, China, US, and, and also international bodies like the UN and the OECD, they're all developing different approaches to AI. And so as we try to widen this conversation and be more inclusive and bring in voices from the global south and elsewhere that may in fact be most affected by these regulatory frameworks and regimes, but have the least input into how they're formed. 
Uh, what are the key questions we need to ask to incentivize interoperability? And are we going to have a situation where multiple regulatory regimes conflict? And how can that be managed at a global level? So I want to call on uh, Robert to, to walk us through this a little bit, given the extensive work you've done on this issue, and then turn to Kieran after that. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. I don't think that, um, you know, I can't chime in in the sense of, uh, here's the answer, everybody you know, just write it down. I, I, I don't think, um, I don't think we're at that point. Um, what I, what I can say is that I think it's helpful to have multiple fora. Um, so we have, uh, for instance, a G7 process that looks like when it comes to standards and monitoring, um, that, that sort of, um, leading the way at the moment, the Japanese prime minister said that they were going to have, um, standards out uh, before the end of the year. Um, that is for frontier AI. Um, I should say leading the way uh, really on frontier AI, I think, you know, they're, they're obviously the European Union and, and others are leading the way uh, more, more broadly. Um, but I think it's just really important to have multiple fora because I think it has sort of strategic benefits. I think we've seen this in past negotiations. Uh, sometimes if there's only one place where things are happening, for instance, um, let's say the, the discussions over lethal autonomous weapons, uh, which are only happening in the UN at the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, or for a long time were only happening there. Um, there were certain actors that uh, wanted to object to uh, what other actors were seeking. And the result was that there really wasn't uh, too much in the way of uh, direct progress for, for more than a decade. And so I think uh, sometimes when there's another fora that some of the actors uh, that want to say, well, listen, if we're not going to make progress in this forum, then we can jump to the other forum. And that can be a kind of a risk to uh, some of the actors that maybe are uh, a little bit more dragging their feet in the first forum, then that's that's just very effective strategically. And I think, um, I think we could very likely see that here. I think with, uh, for instance, China uh, being uh, involved in the AI summit, uh, but not in the G7, um, you know, that raises the possibility uh, of agreeing on some things. And, and Brianna pointed out the, the Belt and Road uh, AI governance initiative that China announced uh, recently. And that, that really looked like the sort of thing that could have been written by the UK. Um, you know, it was it was quite detailed in addressing a, a similar set of, of risks uh, to, to what the AI summit is addressing. And so, um, so I think there is a possibility for cooperation here. But if we are if we have uh, only a single process, I think it sort of raises raises the risk in a way. And, and having the ability to, to forum shop a little bit, I think, is, is actually helpful. Yeah, I think you had some some views on this as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting topic. Great question, and pick up on a couple of things that Robert said. So, I think it will tease out maybe three really important strategic issues. This question. So, again, apologies for looking at it from a UK standpoint, but all countries and regions will be looking at it from their own standpoint. And if you were in Dining Street or wherever with a whiteboard, I don't know how they do these things these days, but you were having a strategy session. And this is long term strategy. You know, it's only a year to go to an election here, but this is the sort of decisions that are quite hard but have to be taken for long term strategic interest. I think, you know, um, Let's look at EU, China, and the so-called Global South, three big um, sets of relationships, partnerships, and so forth. So I, I genuinely think, despite all the problems of associated with the UK's withdrawal from the European Union and so forth, that actually the current model of EU regulation might struggle to adapt itself to some of um, the challenges of AI. You know, it's slow, it can be very detailed, can be very inflexible, and it's based on tech that by and large is not based in Europe. So I think actually, you know, whatever one thinks of Brexit is now a reality. Um, in the sort of rich, saturated, you know, digitally mature continent of Europe, there are certain flexibilities that the UK may actually successfully exploit in this uh, in this space. And then there's a question about to what extent does it want to be a competitor uh, to the European Union um, as um, versus a partner. That's, that's a choice. Don't know where it'll go. But like Robert, I think we're in the stage of exposing the questions rather than giving the answers. 
Uh, China is even more interesting. Um, and I really want to pick up on something Robert said here about the sort of you know uncanny, almost eerie uh, similarities between some of the Chinese guidelines and uh, some of the British uh, and other uh, Western uh, ones. I mean, the, the even more interesting thing for me was the first set of Chinese guidelines before they were revised, where they talked about you know the large language models saying that you had to guarantee you know users had to guarantee that the input inputting data was in line with socialist principles. Now, obviously, in term in operational terms, that's inoperable. I mean, it's nonsensical, and it's not surprising that. It collapse but what what to me it reveals is a really interesting thing you're not being soft on china by pointing out that china has no more interest in fact it's probably more scared of a free-for-all in air than than the west is you know just like 25 years ago it was very very worried about internet-based technology posing a threat to the regime China has no interest in some sort of free for all where any old group of you know um, nihilists have access to lethal technology now, then the question, I mean, so firstly, you know, we talk a lot, and we're talking a lot today in the UK about, you know, the controversial decision to invite China, of course, being um, slightly presumptuous Westerners, we haven't actually given much thought to the fact that the Chinese accepted and it wasn't a slam dunk that they would accept the invitation, whether it was right or wrong to extend once it was extended, it was accepted. So presumably, there is parts of that system that see some merit in a global set of in some sort of global framework that can manage the worst risk now how far then do the west want to take that because you could just leave it as a hotline for really difficult stuff uh, or you could have a more um um uh, expansive uh, uh framework where you know which would of course be controversial and certainly anything that's an interoperable between the you know between the west and china will uh, be very difficult and, and, and extremely controversial but at the same time, um, it looks like at least a skeletal framework may exist. The global side for me is the most fascinating part. And I think, you know, one of the advantages of working on our school, if we can be parochial for the minute, is that it is genuinely global. And I think, look, um, in cyberspace, in the sort of, you know, first generation, the last generation of governance and so forth, um, Western countries have more or less stood up and said, um, international law applies in cyberspace and the post-1945 rules-based international order is just fine. And most of the global South doesn't buy that. And um, I think there's a really interesting choice, strategic choice over decades for the West as new tech rules develop for the age of AI is, are you going to try and, and uh, are you going to try and just assert this sort of, you know, adaptable primacy of the 1945 rules to sort of technology that wasn't envisaged back then and an economic balance in the world that is changing? Or are you going to think about how you might recalibrate some of this uh, to give a greater say to, frankly, non-Anglophone, non, you know, largely post-Christian Western societies um, who currently have been setting most of the rules for technology hitherto? I think that's a huge issue and I don't know where it'll go. And while we're just on this topic, I want to stay on it briefly because we had a related question about whether there are any particular areas where you, Kieran, and others see the potential for cooperation on AI with China and, and other states. Are there any particular areas like banning lethal autonomous weapons systems or others where it's easier to get consensus, uh, you know, than others, just like, you know, the we did on chemical weapons and biological weapons in more traditional zones. Do you want to touch on that briefly, Kieran, and then we'll turn to Roxanne. Well, really briefly, because I've probably spoken too much, but um, I think like, things involving physical safety, particularly on a sort of cross-border basis, or um, that are to do with the physical safety, um, uh, particularly in things that traverse international frontiers, like, you know, AI and transportation and so forth, it's almost inevitable that it'll have to do that. And one assumes it'll be more difficult that um, the use of military force, um, absolutely. And thirdly, although again, probably a bit harder still, um, you know, control over over non-state actors and proliferation of, of capabilities. I think those are, are are three areas. I think you know, um, if you look at the here and now, the scourge of disinformation. Um, I don't think you'll uh, get anything on that because what we mean by information integrity differs very wildly depending on where you are in the world. And I think actually one of the, to go back to things you might get on, um, I think actually research into, you know, monitoring the uh, distant but uh, uh, um, uh, essential sort of existential risk, we'll probably get something uh, there. I mean, Julie spoke about the AI Safety Institute and so forth. Um, um, I don't see much global pushback on that sort of thing. So there are areas I think that we can um, see the contours of um, collaboration. Great, thank you so much. I want to shift to a slightly different topic. We have a, a 
an interesting question from the audience about how emerging economies such as Ghana and other states, how can they effectively address safety concerns related to AI as they embark on digitalizing the economy? What are key factors that should be prioritized to ensure the efficient delivery of public services to ensure that there's that proper balance between risk and opportunity uh, for all citizens and not just for the few. I want to turn to Roxana now to weigh in on this question and to the previous debate. Roxana, over to you. Thank you. Let me start with the previous one around interoperability and the question of, uh, of standards in a way, because the way we've done interoperability in the past, if you look at the way the internet works, it has all been around standards. Even if we had differences in the governance frameworks, we had the same set of standards, and that meant you could go to a global network. Right now, we are in a very different paradigm where many of the standards for AI are uh, protected and they belong to companies. They belong to very powerful companies that are not necessarily willing to share that with the rest of the world. And that's one area where I actually think there is potential for working together internationally because it's to the detriment of us all that we don't have those common standards. So um, in the past, we've, we've had a technical community that was operating a voluntary regime to sign up for the standards. But that technical community had um, relatively well-balanced representation of those different perspectives. And as long as a standard could be proven to be uh, effective, it could be approved. Now, of course, you could adopt it or not adopt it, but it was there and it, it had passed a, um, a review process that was very thorough. If we don't have something similar for AI, and if it all happens in different camps, in different ecosystems that are entirely privatized, uh, we have no public oversight over it either. And that's where I think uh, some of these um, conversations that are starting today are ultimately uh, going to, because we need that kind of interoperable system of standards before we can even talk about governance uh, um, regimes that are communicating with one another. And ultimately, it's a question of data as well. So we might have standards that apply, but then we might have protections in place for the data that different AI systems use. And that brings me to, um, to the question uh, about uh, emerging economies. And while we're talking about existential risks and threats of um, autonomous uh, Systems, I guess the uh, the view on the ground and the more realistic take on AI is the everyday integration of AI into our uh, our work, into our lives, and we need a very different set of measures for limiting the harms coming from that, as opposed to what we might think in terms of uh, frontier AI models. I think many countries are now confronted with digitalization and digital transformation, and with these very direct risks of all their data of the citizens being used or misused, um, issues around uh, bias discrimination, labor market transformations, questions of, um, of the consequences of, uh, of applying these systems uh, in the everyday life. And those require regulation at the national level. We've seen it in the EU, it, it is already happening. We are getting more and more limitations on how you can use certain systems. China has done it for the health sector. They have limited use for, um, for AI in health. And we're exploring and experimenting with a number of uh, limitations um, towards the use of AI. So I guess there are two different conversations. And if you are, they happen, if you want, if they happen in parallel, on the one hand, we have the everyday uh, consequences of AI, and then we have the existential risks. Thank you so much, Roxana. We have a little bit over 10 minutes left, so I'm going to turn to the final question, which is, how do we prevent the negative externalities of AI, such as hyper-concentrated markets leading to disproportionate wealth and power amongst a few countries and tech companies? And I want to turn to Julie on this question because, Julie, you spoke a bit at the beginning about harnessing the opportunities associated with AI. And I think one issue that hasn't been adequately addressed this far is how to ensure that those benefits are, in fact, shared equitably and in a just manner. 
We know that only a handful of countries will control the most advanced models, infrastructure, and data to fully harness the power of AI. So we are truly on the precipice of a huge imbalance in AI power, which will impact individuals disproportionately. Um, Julie, what are your thoughts on this and, and what can be done to ensure that AI power is shared equitably and justly? Thank you very much, Brianna, and, and specifically to the person who asked this very, very important question that will uh, certainly define the, the, the years to come and development of AI in general. To respond to that, I will I will provocatively say, first of all, that this is not just a question of development, of fairness, of being equitable. This is a question of making sure this whole AI infrastructure remains safe. So it's in the interest not only of developing nations, but also of more developed nations to make sure that this equitable distribution of capabilities exists. Uh, that would be my first um, element on to, to answer your question. The second element is um, obviously there is th th there there are there are common aspects that will be shared, right? We we need to remember that for AI to exist, we need data. Today, data is not the monopoly of one company. It's not the monopoly of one country. Uh, when when I connect. To I don't know Instagram or anything else. Um, what I do there is is I, I create I contribute to a a a you know to an infrastructure. Um, of course, we can debate the fact the privacy aspect absolutely, but the reality remains that for Instagram to operate in the first place, it needs me <laughs> to create content and to create and to leave a certain set of data. So I think for countries in the developing world. It, 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 it requires a shift in thinking that, you know, this is not just about equi being equitable. This is about being participating in, in a thriving economy and in an important innovation. Um, secondly, how can we then, uh, you know, make sure everyone um, has, you know, access? That requires, first of all, to make sure that research, the, the academic side of things is extremely important. Recently, the European Union uh, has been the first government, uh, the first, it's not a government, it's a, it's a union, uh, the first entity internationally to request from private sector companies, technology companies, that those companies provide access, external access to their internal data, how their platforms are being used, how their recommender systems work, um, and, 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 and a series of other of other very important aspects to be studied by researchers. Well, we can absolutely copy that. For any discussions on AI, I think the question of data access and data transparency is, is, is going to be essential. Uh, by providing, by making sure that that data access is not limited only to researchers in the United States or in the European Union, by also making sure that researchers in academic institutions in Africa, Latin America, Asia, uh, Oceania and other places of the world, making sure that those researchers can access this data can help certainly make the AI race more equitable. That's the first aspect. The second aspect, there is a big conversation now on open sourcing AI models. Some will say it's dangerous. Of course, there are certain, uh, there are high risk in doing that. Um, and others will say that this is an opportunity for, uh, to, to leverage the game to some extent. It's challenging, but I think it is important if we want to make sure there is public interest at heart in the way we develop technology and the way AI deploys itself, open source needs to be central to the conversation. The details, of course, you know, will have to be discussed because of course they are, very important risk to, to, to bear in mind, but uh, the principle of making sure that some aspect of the AI race and industry will have to be done in an open source manner is essential. Uh, the, the, the last but not least aspect, which is it requires a lot of money to run a, a you know, a servers. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's a whole infrastructure that many countries in the developing world cannot 
certainly afford. So is there a possibility for agreement there? Sharing, infra sharing of infrastructure, uh, sharing of data. I think the word, the center word here will be uh, sharing, uh, but not sharing out of just, you know, a, a good sentiment. It's sharing to preserve the safety of the infrastructure, of the global infrastructure that AI is. And this is going to benefit not only the countries that need it, the developing countries that need it, but also the developed nations that need it. And last but not least, the companies that need um, um, that develop AI tools. That would be some aspects of the response that I would provide. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And Robert, what are your views on access to AI power at the global level? Yeah, I just wanted to um, emphasize a couple of things actually that uh, that Julie was just pointing pointing to. Um, or, or maybe look at things just from a, a, a slightly different uh, perspective, but uh, to come to the same conclusion and um, and and really emphasize, I think there's a connection between regulation and and development um, because without effective global global regulation, there'll be the same tired distinction and and differing interests. On the ones on the one hand, you'll have frontier AI countries, who are talking about risks and talking about using words like proliferation and harmful proliferation. And on the other hand, you will have um, this uh, call for justice from the from other uh, places in the world who will demand access, will demand equity and fairness. And, and that will simply be a debate. And, and, and those, um, you know those debates have not have not produced uh, great outcomes in the past, but I think it's really through regulation that we can try to overcome uh, this divide. Because if we have regulation, then you know frontier uh, jurisdictions and, and companies who may be worried about, let's say, you know, if we talk more specifics about fine tuning access or or something like that, um, access to data, as was mentioned, all, you know, all the different sorts of access that are absolutely essential. To, to global um, fairness and development. Um, those things will be seen as risks unless there is a regulatory framework uh, that, um, that, that, that can work. And I, and I think you know, we're probably not uh, talking about uh, a regulatory framework where there's like you know, a, a regulator that's gonna go into the uh, offices of all the AI companies around the world or, or something like that. But if regulation sits at the national level, but then there's an international regulator that can sort of audit uh, those um, national level jurisdictions, just the way that uh, the Financial Action Task Force does, or I shouldn't say just the way, but in a similar way to what the Financial Action Task Force does, even though it's not very popular, it, it may have some positive effects, uh, or um, the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, or the International Maritime Organization, and others, uh, they're really auditing the regulations uh, that exist in jurisdictions, I think, uh, could be uh, quite an effective regulatory regime. And I just want to say one very quickly, that it doesn't always seem like regulation is going in this direction, particularly in the United States and, and in other uh, areas of the G7. There really seems to be a focus on export restrictions as what we mean by global regulation. And um, I think those expert restrictions on elements of the semiconductor supply chain have two issues. Uh, in my view, uh, they're likely to be ineffective, um, at least in terms of solving um, the problems that they're meant to address uh, for a variety of reasons, including the capabilities of many other actors around the world. And secondly, they're going to be unjust because uh, they're going to not involve voice for affected communities around the world. So I think, you know, we need to create global governance regimes that do include voice and do allow access. I think, you know, there's some possibilities there, but it, it you know, it's not that all actors are going in that direction at the moment. Thank you so much, Robert. That's certainly the case. You've given us a lot to reflect on today. We are nearing the end of our time, unfortunately. So while it's clear we won't solve any of these challenges here today, I want to thank our panelists for a fascinating and productive discussion. You've all given us much to reflect on ahead of the AI Safety Summit on how we can ensure that the future of AI is indeed safe AI. 
So this concludes our session. Thank you so much for joining us today.